I've been told that there is a small village that counts 350 inhabitants and is located in typically Irish grass hill scenery next to the rocky sea coast. However, the nicest part of the surrounding coastal countryside is a military restricted area and has been occupied by a British army camp for more than 100 years. Anne-Marie showed me a village model of this place. Sand symbolises the beach. On one side of the fence, ceramic houses depict the army barracks, whereas the ones on the other side represent the village. A sand path goes the whole way to the back beach. Up until three years ago, the villagers used to be able to walk to the back beach, but now they can't anymore because they have to pass the military area. Anne-Marie founded two cultural centres. One is a converted caravan and the other one is a disused hairdresser's. She organises social activities for mother and toddler meetings to bingo for pensioners. Her practice is described as actions which seem like practical community work and are turned into happenings and performances through her politically provocative, practical and poetic artistic vision. Philip told me that he has a personal reason for taking an interest in the camp at the village. Because, as a young boy growing up in a very Protestant environment, he didn't have the slightest compunction doing that. Because he didn't remotely think that the British Army was anything other than protecting him. So he worked there for two summers, and just after the final summer, a few days after he left, the IRA blew up the soldier's home where he was working. This happened just after he painted it and killed people whom he knew well. There was the Great War and the military camp played an important role in it as a training camp for the Ulster Division. Philip told me that by December 1914, the entire British Brigade of the Ulster Division was assembled in the newly built tin camp, made up of sturdy huts faced with corrugated iron and heated by smoky coal and log burners. It was the name World's End which stuck to the place in the winter of 1914-1915. Many men did feel they had come from the bright lights and bustle of the city to the very end of the world. Although there had been an army camp here since the earliest days of the Boer War, the facilities were minimal and the atmosphere, in winter time rather bleak. According to Philip, the Ulster Division was to parade in full military ceremony through the streets of central Belfast on the 8th of May 1915, shortly before the War Office sent them to the front line in France, where they found themselves stranded under shell fire in no man's land, within a bloody battle zone that could not have been more different from the quiet, windswept coastal isolation of the training camp. After the Great War was the Irish War of Independence, which started in 1919. Numerous Republican prisoners were taken to the British Army base that was transformed to service as an internment camp until 1921. Anne-Marie showed me a train station that is about four miles away from the camp and told me that many of the Republican prisoners came to this stop and then had to walk up to the camp. Louis, one of these prisoners, remembered that when he reached the internment camp on the 5th of January in 1920, conditions were tolerable for him. But the other prisoners told him that during the first two or three weeks of the camp, the treatment they had received had been very bad. 
After they had been duly handcuffed, they were marched into the cage, where the handcuffs were at once removed. They were brought into an office where the colours of their eyes and the cuffs of their nose were solemnly recorded, and questions put to them as to whether they were married or single. The camp consisted of four lines of huts with a chapel, a cookhouse, dining halls and a hospital in the centre. 